Okay, so uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Stuart Desson. I'm excited to be here to basically share with you how the Lumina Spark model, Big Five model, um, <coughs> maps onto the periodic table of uh, Professor Woods. And I should kick off by saying um, I really wasn't going to do this because about five years ago when I was doing my PhD, um, I was under pressure from my supervisor just to get it done. And I went to see Professor Woods, and he said, no, if you want to be contemporary, you need to map to the periodic table. So I went back and told him I was going to do this, and he said, you mustn't do that. So I did it anyway, and uh, that's why I'm here presenting it today. Um, so uh, thank you for encouraging me to do that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Luminous Spark model. There's um, <coughs> 40 qualities in the model. You can see two mandalas over there on the left. I'll talk a little bit about evaluative bias. Uh, and explain what that means, and then I'm going to map it to the periodic table. So this is the model we're looking at mapping onto the periodic table. It's the big five. It's a hierarchical personality model. So here's what you'd normally expect, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness. Then we have a separate mandala for emotional stability. One key thing that's different with Luminous Spark is that it measures both ends, and that's partly to do with reducing evaluative bias. So we also measure low openness, but we call it down to earth. So it's framed positively. Low uh, conscientiousness is framed positively as inspiration driven. That's good for me because I am inspiration driven. <laughs> um, of course, we have introversion. Uh, and instead of being disagreeable, we refer to being outcome focused. So these are all framed uh, constructively. And here you would have emotional stability going to uh, neuroticism. We refer to this as reward reactors <coughs> and risk reactors to try and take some of the sting out of the judgment in the two different uh, polarities. So um, if we have a look now at evaluative bias to try and explain what it is, I'm going to show some words. <coughs> if you think this word, emotionally you like it and uh, you think it could be good at work, I want you to go yay and put your thumb up or say something, make a noise. If you think, no, you don't like it, give it a thumbs down or, or something like that or something in between. So do we think bashful? How do we feel about bashful? Yay. Yay. From, from <laughs> bold. Yay. 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 More thumbs up. Uh, untalkative. Ooh. Okay. Withdrawn. Ooh. Okay. Uh, quiet. Uh, mixture. Uh, timid. <laughs> We've got a few thumbs down. Active. Way. <laughs> Reserved. In between, uh, inhibited. A few thumbs down. Unrestrained. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Restrained person at the back. Energetic. Yay. Yay. Energy. Yay. Yeah, like unexcitable. Yes. Medium. Yes. I heard a yes. Verbal. Talkative. <laughs> Mixtures. Okay. Shy. You wouldn't be here at the conference if you were shy. Fair mm -hmm. enough. Um, assertive. Yay. Yeah. yeah. Vigorous. Oh. <laughs> Daring. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so there wasn't um, complete consensus on that. There was some, some variability in it. But if we separate it now, these are actually the words from the trait descriptive adjective questionnaire from Goldberg. So that's extroversion and that's introversion. So what do you notice about the difference in the two? Extroversion is more socially desirable. It's more socially desirable. You've got the gist. Um, so this is what I mean by um, evaluative bias. One end of the scale is we associate more positive with, and that can be a valence, it can be even an emotional reaction to it, and the other um, not so. So one of the things I looked to do was to try and quantify what uh, an evaluative bias looks like. So I did a little bit of research that got people to assess these qualities, not in terms of whether they have them, but whether they think they're desirable things or whether they have a positive emotional reaction to them at work, a bit like I just did with you um, anecdotally, and score it on a scale of one to five. And generally speaking, most people <coughs> see this as neutral to positive on average, and most people on average see this as neutral to slightly negative. On a scale of um, one to five, the difference between the two is 1.3. So that's a reasonably strong difference between the, uh, the two polarities. And the column here is the Spark questionnaire that I'm about to map onto the periodic table, which has gone to great lengths to try and be more balanced, to try and say, well, let's measure both ends positively. So for introversion, instead of shy and timid, we say maybe 
you think first before you speak, or you like to listen to people uh, before you give your view, etc. So we're trying to find ways of constructing it that's, um, that's more balanced. And you can see we're not completely successful. There's still some uh, evaluative bias in the Spark instrument. We're working further to um, reduce that right now. But that's just to give you a feel for what I mean by evaluative bias. Um, it's not just me. So Peterson and others said uh, when you have um, <coughs> an evaluatively unbalanced set of descriptors, such as Goldberg's adjectives, and you do a rotation algorithm, factor analysis, you inevitably get positive versus negative uh, descriptors. So other people are reporting on, on this um, as well. Um, and it really means that you're valuing certain traits more than others. Um, it also, well this was researched by Peabody in 1967, so the approach I've taken in Spark follows this approach of measuring both ends positively and, uh, and negatively, but it's largely ignored in psychometrics in terms of psychometric design. It is obviously well understood, uh, but it's not always used in terms of choosing items and choosing uh, scales. Um, and it can affect the, the valence in the wording from opposite extremes, which you've just done with sort of introvert, extrovert. And sometimes we don't even measure um, certain traits, and we don't like, so for example, being confident in terms of uh, emotional stability. We often don't measure that in terms of being too overconfident. Yeah? So it's often missing from certain models. So this is what it looks like. Typically, we measure introversion with, like, I make friends easily, and sometimes I listen too much, I don't give my view. If we want to apply that Peabody approach, we sort of basically split it into four. We measure both ends, adaptively and maladaptively. And the gist of it is, that's essentially what we're doing in this approach with these um, 40 qualities across these two mandalas. So... Just a few more words on evaluative bias, and one of them is to say, when we measure it maladaptively, you know, outcome focus, disagreeableness becomes winning at all costs, and the other end, agreeableness becomes people pleasing up uh, up the top here. And we can be emotionally stable and resilient, but we could ignore stress and become overconfident and over optimistic. You get the idea. So one reason for wanting to take some of this bias out is it can um, help. Uh, when people are pressured to respond in a socially desirable way. So here's just a piece of data which is raw scores against these qualities for an applicant sample with a high stakes, people want the job, versus uh, no, no high stakes. And you can see by reducing the evaluative bias, we've, we've got them pretty close, but still in a, in a job situation, people don't want to admit that they're spontaneous and break the rules. Uh, but they do want to say that they're a bit more reliable and organised than they otherwise uh, might be. That's the gist of, um, of the data. And evaluated bias, interestingly, well, Ashton of Hexago fame and Backstrom, they suggest that the, the, the general factor of personality that, that Reiner mentioned earlier um, is a bit of a mirage caused by social desirability uh, and so on. So Ashton has done a paper that says um, if you get high-stakes people and not so high-stakes do a factor analysis, you get... A, the general factor with the high stakes, but it evaporates with the um, other one. And Backstrom suggests um, if you neutralise your questionnaire and take some of these evaluative biases out, uh, again, that the general factor will, will disappear. So uh, I'm sort of a bit more in their camp uh, than the, the camp that's pushing the general factor as, as the best thing, um, the best new thing. So you can see the differences here are not too significant. Um, I've probably highlighted the main ones. So let me uh, <coughs> move on now to the periodic table. So you can see here we've got five across the top, which is the big five, and then split into ten at both ends on the, on the vertical. In the analysis I'm going to share, I break it into a ten by ten, because you've got the idea with Spark we're measuring both ends, so this goes from a five by ten to a, a ten by ten. Um, 671 people here, reasonable split gender-wised, generally professional uh, backgrounds, so it wasn't a student population. And the Spark uh, questionnaire was 240 items with Goldberg's 100 uh, trait descriptive adjectives, of which you looked at uh, 20 of them earlier. We did hypothesize that the 40 qualities would load primary or secondarily onto the factor we expect uh, with the TDA. Um, and even in the maladaptive, uh, adaptive and maladaptive forms, we were sort of hoping, thank you, that that would be the case. And here's the results. So 
There's 40 qualities here, um, replicating the, the format that the previous speaker showed. You've got the primary and the secondary loading with the ratio and the vector. And of the 40, we found that um, 38 of them uh, were loading as we would expect, but we found a couple of deviants. One, confidence, and another one up here, evidence-based. So I'm going to explain those, or, or possibly explain those in a, in a moment, because we did in the research find that other people, when they've tried to measure low openness, and so evidence-based is an attempt at low openness, like just pause, give me the facts, let me check the details. Um, <clears throat> in the literature, it seemed that that was like low openness, but actually when it's measured behaviorally, behaviorally in a positive way, it starts to correlate with conscientiousness. That's what some other researchers have found, and that's what we're finding here. And with uh, confident, we're expecting it to be like emotional stability, uh, a reward reactor, uh, but we were wondering whether by making it overconfident, like I know everything's going to go well and it can always work, am, are we building in some neuroticism? Could some of that be um, affecting the loading? So that's something that we wanted to look at. And this is the result of the, the 40 qualities being mapped um, onto the periodic table, which is a 10 by 10 rather than the normal uh, 5 by 10. And you can see some of the interesting things such as... Uh, you know, here you've got uh, agreeableness, but agreeableness with uh, neuroticism is empathy. Agreeableness, uh, disagreeableness with neuroticism is being independent and sort of I know I'm right. So you're getting some extra nuance by putting the extra columns in. This is going completely uh, to the full extent, and we're taking the ones that say EU here. These ones are adaptive measures. We call this everyday and underlying. And the ones with an O are overextended, or you could call it maladaptive. So we can see here, you know, this is the risk reactor, what would be called neuroticism. Generally, it is going on um, low emotional stability uh, with, a, with a switch here. But we have highlighted that nine of them at this detailed level go somewhere that we weren't quite um, expecting. So we started to try and uh, unpack that and um, understand it. So... Um, <coughs> With the uh, confident um, item, it seems that it is something to do, or the confident items, it's something to do with when you are internally confident, it's emotional stability, but as I start to express it more and you see it, it looks a bit more like extroversion, and as I overdo it, it looks even more like um, extroversion and starts to pick up uh, or increase the loading on, uh, on neuroticism. So there's some interesting things going on when we switch from adaptive measures to maladaptive measures. Uh, which require quite a bit more um, unpacking. So generally speaking, if I just go back here, when you make something maladaptive or overextended, you know, on average, there's an extra 0.17 loading goes on to neuroticism as you move in that direction, that's sort of across the board. And actually, there's a bit more disagreeableness creeps in when you move to maladaptive across the board. So there's some interesting things going on between adaptive and maladaptive. So, um, <clears throat> if I now go to, uh, this is um, uh, Professor Wood's labelling of the, uh, uh, the facets in the periodic table with all the different blends, and if we load in on top of that the additional 40 uh, that we've covered here, some of them are entirely consistent with what was found before, and you can see leadership boldness there expressing your emotions, taking charge, and so on. And some of them are new, like focusing feelings in conscientiousness with a little bit of neuroticism coming in uh, to, to get things um, done. So in conclusion, um, you can see here we've made a, a really good effort to reduce evaluative bias in the Big Five by measuring both ends adaptively and maladaptively. And this helps us with our construct um, validity, gives us more fidelity, and it gives us a really nice comprehensive mapping onto uh, Professor Wood's uh, table. There is further re research to do here on the effect of valence, on where things are located in the periodic table, how you know, how's my emotional response to questions impact how I answer it and where it turns up in that table. And actually, I, I need to say this is influencing our, our next version of Spark that's coming out. So we've been going for 10 years, we're revising some of the items, and this... Uh, analysis is incredibly helpful to us, to us um, adjusting and nuancing some of the items so that they do measure exactly 
what we want them to, uh, to measure as part of that process. So really that's what I wanted to um, say. Are there any questions? Um, that was very interesting, thank you. I just wondered, you know when you showed the graphic of the difference between the high states and the low states responses yes. to your questionnaire, do you have one of those to show, um, or can you, can you say anything about the difference between the uh, original version of the Big Five versus yours in terms of value to bias rather than two versions of your own one? Yeah, um, so I, I don't, but that would be a really interesting thing to do. That would be really, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. It would be good to see what the differences I was showing there. Is that more or less or the same as, yeah. you know, the Pappy and, and Hogan and so on? Yes. Uh, the truth is I don't really know, but we'd have to do that. But that would be a good piece of research to do. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Yep. Are, are you are you kind of questioning the use of the TDA for creating the periodic table in the first place? Um, that wasn't the intention of, no. of this. No, I think it's uh, because it's incredibly well established. It's almost like the backbone of the Big Five in the academic literature, along with the NEO. I think it, it is a good one to benchmark up all other instruments by. <clears throat> However, I am highlighting that it does have evaluative bias in it, um, which is completely because it's been it's been constructed using factor analysis and it's extremely sort of inductive in that regard with correlations and as Peterson showed that will tend to separate out and create an evaluative bias due to that method whereas the Luminous Spark method uh, is bringing in a much more deductive approach with a bit of criterion centric to, to, to try and balance it so I'm not questioning it no but I am saying you need to take that into account when you look at it you yeah? know but another great question. I think we're going to have a panel at the front. Or no, is it